It's okay. Like a oh yeah, well done. Two X, and even before I had the lighting right there, it finally, it's right now. Um, yes, trichoblastoma. How did you know, Barack? Oh, just the basal-like cells, and it just has the typical pattern. Yeah, it's like, just got a look, doesn't it? Yeah. It's got a look. The the one thing that really helps me, and so trichoblastoma and trichoepithelioma, to me, are two tumors that are either exist on a spectrum or are variants of the same thing. Some people say trichoep doesn't exist. They're all just trichoblastomas. To me, it doesn't matter. Benign hair follicle tumor. It's fun to split things out for our nerdiness and, um, and for growing scientific knowledge. But for patient care in general, if I get to benign hair follicle tumor and not basal cell carcinoma at a practical level, I'm happy with that. So um, you can feel differently, but that's how I feel. So yeah, one thing that helps me, blue basaloid with this branchy kind of... Uh, staghorn antler shape kind of look that always makes me think of hair follicle although we know basal cells can do that too but look what we got here we've got a nodule that's popped out basically with nothing attached to it so probably it was deep dermis or subcutis right well basal cells don't grow that way right basal cells almost always either connect directly to the epidermis or an adnexal structure and they usually start in the superficial dermis or epidermis and then grow down you can have them grow down to the subcutis but they're not going to present as a solitary circumscribed nodule deep down. The other thing that helps me is look at the stroma. The stroma around benign hair follicle tumors is tends to be kind of more cellular. It often has more pink collagenous fibrous stuff. It can sometimes have a little myxoid change like a basal cell does, but it doesn't usually have the, the mucin filled clefts or a myxoid filled clefts between the stroma and the tumor. So even from here, I can see that the, the stroma comes right up next to the tumor. I'll show you closer in one second. The other thing, and perhaps to me, one of the best things and most helpful when you get it, and I feel like this particularly works for big, deep trichoblastomas and not for the small, superficial trichoeps, which is kind of like how the people who train me were like, basically, if it's small in the dermis, has some keratin-filled cysts, then they tended to call those trichoeps. If it was bigger, more cellular, deeper, they would call it trichoblastoma. But again, whole textbooks have been written just about hair follicle tumors. So if you're really into how to split that out, go for it. But uh, for me, uh, that's kind of a, a pragmatic, practical approach. But look at the stroma here. You can tell that the stroma around this is not normal dermis or subcutis. It is the stroma of this tumor, and it's got an edge, and the edge is right here. It had a plane of section between it and the surrounding tissue, and it popped and pulled right out like a marble when they went to excise it. Like, I think they thought this was a cyst, because, you know, everything's a cyst until it's not. But this is good, and I've got a, another one on my Kiko um, uh, page, my Dermpath directory. I'll have a link down below if you're watching this online. And you go uh, search on that page, Control F and search or Command F for trichoblastoma. And I've got a digital slide of one, different pattern than this, but you can still see just like this, it's got this ball of stroma. All the basaloid islands are encased in this ball of cellular stroma and is completely sharply circumscribed and distinct from the surrounding tissue. I find that really useful because basal just, that's not how basal grows, not in my experience. Okay. So then the next thing is look at the stroma. The stroma is wrapped tightly right around the edges with usually no or sometimes very focal rare clefting, but usually no clefting. And here it's a kind of like more fibrous looking stroma. It's just got a look, okay? And, um, and it comes right up. Now, why have I not talked about the blue basaloid cells? Because to me, those are actually the least important thing in making the diagnosis of a, of a benign basaloid hair follicle tumor like a trichoep or trichoblastoma. If you go look at the basaloid cells, they look a lot like basal cell carcinoma. Yes, people have tried to say the little of this or a little less of that, but in my experience, the stroma and the way that the shape of the nest and the way they interact with the stroma and the way the stroma interacts with the surrounding skin is the most helpful thing to help me recognize benign hair follicle tumors, okay? Then you can look closer. Now, this one actually had a decent bit of mitotic activity scattered in here, but I just didn't think that there was enough atypia to make it something more exotic, like a trichoblastic carcinoma or something like that. Um, there are such things, and there is debate over how to identify them, but to me, this was in the range of a benign hair follicle tumor. Somebody might say, well, there's too many mites, it's atypical or whatever, but in any case, you can go read up more on that. There's a lot of controversy about those things. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't get, I don't find, unless it's like frankly, cytologically malignant, like nasty, ugly looking high grade cells, then I'm going to be really worried about it. But otherwise, I don't find like looking at the cytology or counting mitoses or anything like that 
to be very helpful to discriminate basal cell carcinoma from trichoblastic tumors. Uh, sometimes you can do CK20 and see scattered benign Merkel cells, which tend to be present in more abundance in benign basal or hair follicle tumors like trichoep and trichoblastoma and tend to be minimal or absent in basal cell carcinomas. Not a totally perfect test, but of all the immunostain things, I personally find that one the most useful of the ones that I have tried. There are some other newer options out there that I have not really explored yet, but um, yeah, there you go. What was the last thing I was going to say? It was... Hmm. Oh, papillary mesenchymal bodies. Those tend to be uh, more abundant in the smaller superficial trichoepitheliomas, and I feel like it's hit or miss whether you see them in trichoblastomas. If you find them, awesome. But I don't recall this one having any real good papillary mesenchymal bodies, so I am not disturbed by, by a trichoblastoma without good papillary mesenchymal bodies, because that's okay. Uh, but I do feel like you see them, but, oh wait, maybe I, told, maybe I lied to you. Maybe I'm confusing this in another case. There's kind of ones here, they're not the best. This like little cluster right here is a very primitive kind of papillary mesenchymal body. And if you guys are like, what? That does not look like one. I agree. It's not the best, but it is kind of like the spectrum of papillary mesenchymal body. But as one of my fellows, Ed Fulton, used to like to say, he's like, I like my papillary mesenchymal bodies with a capital P. Like I want them to look perfect. So these are like kind of weak ones. But you can go. I've got stuff on the Kiko uh, page about good papillary mesenchymal bodies. All right. So we, we belabored that one, but a real nice trichoblastoma. I'll try to go faster. You guys know I always say that and I never pull it off. But never give up, right?